Welcome back. In this video, we're just going to do a couple of quick examples using the epsilon delta characterization of the limit of a function, just to practice showing how it works and how we attack problems like this. So we'll start with a pretty straightforward one, and it's just to show that the limit as x tends to 2 of f of x equals 7, and our function f of x equals 3x plus 1. Now, of course, you're probably used to solving problems like this from your earlier calculus courses, and you just eyeball it and say, well, let's just plug the number in. Um, we can't do that yet because we haven't justified it. So we're actually going to show how this works with the epsilon delta characterization, and later on we'll justify being able to just substitute this number in, in general for problems like these. So to go about doing this, we just need to follow the template using our epsilon delta um, limit property. So it's going to start with something like this. Let epsilon be greater than zero. And we seek, this is looking very much like our sequence ones, except now we're using the epsilon delta functional limit um, property. So we seek a delta greater than zero such that whenever the absolute value of x minus, now c is the point I'm taking the limit at, so it's going to be absolute value of x minus 2 is less than delta. It follows that the absolute value of f of x, which for us is 3x plus 1, minus the candidate limit value. Okay, and I'll just actually quickly tidy this up in place, 3x minus 6 is less than epsilon. So when we were working with sequence convergence, we were always seeking a capital N. The template for working with the epsilon delta de uh, definition of the limit of a function is almost the same, except now the thing that we're seeking is no longer a big N for a sequence, it's a delta for um, our function. Okay. So maybe we'll just make a little working area like we often do, just down the side here. And we'll start by have, taking a look at this absolute value here. We can see that we can factor that out. So that equals absolute value of 3. Don't really need to write that, but let's just emphasize the point. Times absolute value of x minus 2, which obviously just equals 3 absolute value of x minus 2. Now what I'm trying to do when I'm manipulating my inequality here, or my, my working here, is I'm trying to get absolute value of x minus 2 to appear somehow in from this expression here. Because I know that I can control how big this is by choosing a particular delta. And all I have to do is I have to choose a value of delta that will make this overall less than epsilon. So remember, I'm free to choose delta. And I have epsilon at my disposal. It's been fixed at the moment. So I'm going to choose delta to equal epsilon over 3. So then if this particular expression is less than epsilon over 3, then overall absolute value of, sorry, if delta, if x minus 2 is less than epsilon over 3, then overall this total expression, which is that multiplied by 3, will be less than epsilon. So I will let delta equal epsilon over 3. So this is phase 2. I've, I've stated what I want, phase 1. Phase 2, I have chosen a value of delta. And the last step is to demonstrate that the value of delta I've chosen satisfies the right properties. Then, absolute value if 0 is less than absolute value of x minus 2 is less than delta, which equals epsilon over 3. It follows that 3 times the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 3 times epsilon over 3, which equals epsilon. And that is actually what we're trying to show. Because if we just bring that 3 inside the absolute value, i.e. absolute value of 3x minus 6 is less than epsilon. Okay, so the main piece of work involved in this problem is to take our inequality on the right here, mess around with it so that we can get the x minus 2 involved, because that's the thing that we can make as small as we like by choosing an appropriate delta. We chose our delta, and then we showed that if this particular statement was true, uh, the thing we were after follows as a consequence. For our second example, we're going to go slightly more tricky. We'll take um, g of x, limit as x tends to 2 of g of x equals 4, 
where this time g of x equals x squared. And I'll just once again set up a little bit of scribble room at the right here. So we'll start following our normal template. It's really good to just do this the same way every time because it becomes so routine that you don't really need to think about it. So let epsilon be greater than zero. We seek delta greater than zero, such that whenever zero is less than absolute value of x minus c, c is the point at which I'm taking the limit. So it will be for us, it will be two is less than delta, it follows that the absolute value of g of x, which is x squared, minus the limit, is less than epsilon. Okay, so we have chosen an arbitrary epsilon, which is positive, it's now fixed, and we're looking for a corresponding value of delta, such that if this particular thing is true, it follows that this is true here. Okay, so once again, I'm going to dive in by looking at absolute value of x squared minus 4. Hopefully you've been conditioned enough by problems like these that you can see we have the difference of two squares here. So that equals the absolute value of x plus 2 times the absolute value of x minus 2. Okay, and that's good because remember, I'm trying to involve absolute value of x minus 2 somehow in my problem. So I've got the absolute value of x minus 2 just here. The problem is I've also got an additional absolute value of x plus 2 involved here, and it's not perhaps immediately clear how we can get rid of this. So it would be convenient if we could somehow create a bound on how big this thing could be. So imagine that... For example, delta was less than 1. Okay, we don't actually know, we haven't actually chosen our delta yet, so I'm just hoping that this might be the case. If my delta was sufficiently small that it was less than 1, then if absolute value of x minus 2 is less than delta, this can be expressed as, which equals 1. If we write this down as some bounds on x instead of on x minus 2, if absolute value of x minus 2 is, is less than 1, that means x is no further than 1 away from 2. So that we could also write this as 1 is less than absolute value of x. Or well, not absolute value of x. 1 is less than x is less than 3. Okay, so if that were the case, if x is less than 3, we now have some kind of bound on how big absolute value of x plus 2 might be which would imply that absolute value of x plus 2 would be less than 5. Okay, If I add 2 to 3, that's the biggest I can possibly make, absolute value of x plus 2. And so we actually have, if, if we could somehow enforce delta being less than 1, as well as whatever else we're going to require of it, then it will automatically follow that the absolute value of x plus 2 is less than 5. Okay, so if we could make that true, let's just imagine for the moment that we can, then this piece here will be less than 5. And so I can choose delta, like in the previous problem, to make this piece less than epsilon over 5, at which point in time we'll be done. So this could be my delta. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say delta equals epsilon over 5. Okay, this is not going to quite work. So as so long as epsilon is relatively small, so let's say, pretend for a moment epsilon was 1, then delta would be 0.2, which also has delta is less than 1. So if that were the case, if epsilon was 1, then I'd also get this piece of inequality for free. Um, if epsilon was even up to 5, then I'll, I'll get also that inequality being free. But if, if for some reason epsilon was bigger than that, let's say epsilon was 100, just for the sake of argument, 100 over 5 is 20, and so this, it would not follow in this case that the absolute value of delta is less than 1. So we need to make sure we enforce that somehow um, so that we can get both pieces of this inequality statement being true. So rather than making delta just equal epsilon over 5, I'm going to make delta equal the minimum of 1 and epsilon over 5. Okay, making delta smaller is never going to be a problem. So if my epsilon over 5 was 20, it's still going to be true. Uh, what I want to be true 
which is that my x squared minus 4 will be less than epsilon. Um, if I make delta even smaller, then all it's going to do is force x squared even closer to 4. Okay, so I'm going to make delta the minimum of these two things, which will automatically make my two pieces of the inequality true, and then my overall expression will work out. So let's just see how this works. Perhaps this is clearest if we just actually plow on and write the working down. So I'm going to let delta be the minimum of 1 epsilon over 5. Then it follows that if absolute value of x minus 2 is less than delta, we have from this piece over here, absolute value of x plus 2 is less than 5. Okay, um, and we'll also get, um, and the absolute value of x minus 2 is also automatically less than epsilon over 5. Okay, because if, if epsilon over 5 is bigger than 1, then delta will be 1 and absolute value of x minus 2 is still going to be less than that. Hence, the absolute value of x squared minus 4 equals the absolute value of x plus 2, x minus 2, which is less than 5 times epsilon over 5, which equals epsilon, which is exactly what we're after.